This is the Meeting House with Dwight A. Moody. News, reviews, commentary, and conversation on religion and American life. Now, here is Dr. Moody. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Meeting House, where we do have conversation on religion and American life. I'm your host, coming to you from our original studio down in Glen County, Georgia. I'm delighted that you've decided to join us today. There's so much happening in the world of religion, especially as relates to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm delighted to have as my guest, a return guest to the Meeting House, Rabbi Mark Gopin. He is the director of the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter Center for World Religions, Diplomacy and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. Surely that title is relevant to the needs of the world today. He's just published a new book. We're gonna talk briefly with him about that, but we're gonna talk about the religious dynamics of what's going on in Ukraine, the Orthodox Church, the Jewish factor, and how it connects with American religious sensibilities and systems. I, as always, I have five news stories. You've come to expect that. And I'm going to begin now with the top story. I'm beginning in Nashville, Tennessee, as we have so often. It is the center of major religious networks in the United States. So it appears frequently on our um, news. The United Methodists delayed for a third time their annual gathering, largely influenced by an appeal from 170 delegates from around the globe, urging authorities in Nashville to delay the conference until 2024 to, quote, properly ensure the health, safety, and participation of all attendees, end quote. Public health protocols around the world, where many United Methodist delegates live and from which they must travel are not quite as stringent as they are here. And the COVID has not declined as, as much as it has in the United States. But delaying the conference has postponed decisions that have been pending regarding divisions within the United Methodist family. As a result of this postponement, Reverend Keith Boyette, president of the Wesleyan Covenant Association, and chairman of the Transitional Leadership Council announced that they will not wait for another United Methodist meeting and they will proceed to launch a new, more conservative Methodist denomination under the name Global Methodist Church. That's coming in the next few months. And of course, we'll keep you posted here in the meeting house. In New York, Leadership of the Orthodox Church of America issued a statement condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine and calling its people to prayer. The statement reads in part, quote, in light of the distressing developments in Ukraine affecting millions of innocent people in the region, I wholeheartedly urge you to pray for peace and for the well-being of our brothers and sisters who are enduring this tragic moment. I ask that hostilities be ceased immediately and that President Putin put an end to the military operation. As Orthodox Christians, we condemn violence and aggression, end quote. In addition, more than 175 priests in Russia, priests of the Russian Orthodox Church, published a letter opposing the war and calling for the cessation of hostilities. A bold move, for sure. Going back to Nashville, as reported last week here in the meeting house, the current president of the Southern Baptist Convention has announced he will not seek a customary second term. Immediately, two names surfaced as candidates for the June 15th election. The first is Willie Rice, pastor of Calvary Church in Clearwater, Florida, who said he will run for the post. He's widely viewed as an SBC loyalist having served in multiple positions of denominational responsibility. The second is Vody Bachman Jr., Dean of the School of Divinity at African Christian University at Lusaka, Zambia. Bachman is a strong critic of much that is happening in the convention, especially as related to social justice, 
He is also the author of the 2021 book, Fault Lines, The Social Justice Movement and Evangelicalism's Looming Catastrophe. There is some question as to whether his membership in a church in Africa will preclude him from running or serving in a presidential capacity. And I might add, I have read and reviewed this book and you can read my review at themeetinghouse.net. Out in Los Angeles, and this is an interesting story, Atheist United of Los Angeles has an energized cohort called Street Pirates. It is a team of people committed to keeping public streets secular that is, to remove religious messages and signage. They operate on a three-step plan. One, lookouts report unwelcome or illegal religious signage on public land. Two, they investigate to confirm the signage could or and can be removed. And three, they report such findings to the appropriate authorities or they investigate removal. They are particularly active in removing the signs themselves. Their website invites anyone anywhere to become a lookout for illegal signs, especially religious signs, or start a chapter of Street Pirates Where You Live. An interesting story. And finally, from everywhere, all over America, in many ways all over the world, but American churches, temples, synagogues, and worship centers of all kinds and confessions are mobilizing to respond to the war in Ukraine. For instance, the Pentecostal Network CityServe is raising money to supply the needs of 3 million persons through their affiliate congregations all across Europe. Agencies with operations in Ukraine and thus highly motivated to address these refugee needs include Child Evangelism Fellowship, Youth with the Mission, Youth for Christ, the International Fellowship for Evangelical Students, and Samaritan's Purse. The Ukrainian diaspora, especially those organized into Orthodox churches, are also mobilizing to help. More than 1.5 million immigrants from Ukraine were living in Europe prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Most American religious networks have created a way to help through prayer, advocacy, hospitality, and financial generosity. I hope you're a part of one of these networks. I hope you contribute. I hope you are aware of what's going on and can be a part of the solution and caring for all of these refugees. I will be back in just a minute with my guest of the day. This is all the news brought to you by our broadcast partner, PerfectoCoffeeInc.com of California. You can order your coffee from Perfecto Coffee. I'll be back in just a minute. Thank you for joining our conversation on religion and American life in the Meeting House. I'm your host, Dwight A. Moody, coming to you today from Glenn County, Georgia, which is our original broadcast post here in Brunswick, Georgia, St. Simons Island, Jekyll Island. A beautiful day here. I hope it is where you are. I'm glad to welcome back to the Meeting House my friend from Washington, D.C., Rabbi Mark Gopin. He is a, a published author of Significance. We'll mention that in just a minute. And he is the, the director, the executive director of the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter Center for World Religions, Diplomacy and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. And if ever there was a title that prepared a man to deal with what's happening in Ukraine, that is it, because all those things overlap uh, in this uh, conflict in Ukraine. Welcome back to the Meeting House, Mark. Thank you. It's, a, it's wonderful to see you again. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate all the work you do and what you represent uh, coming from uh, a very strong religious tradition yourself and uh, addressing the issues uh, in the, the, on the world stage from that point of view. As you know, it's something that I'm very tuned to as well. Let's start with this remarkable leader in Ukraine, this yeah. Jewish comic, comedian, actor, 
turned politician, now president. My, what a phenomenal story it, it is. He's the hero of much of the Western world. Right. Um, isn't, this, isn't it a remarkable thing that's happened to him and to the country? It, it, it is extraordinary. And, and when everybody first heard about it, that, that a comedian was elected president and a Jewish comedian at that, it was almost a joke in itself. You know, a <laughs> Jewish comedian going back to, you know, Ukraine. And it, but it turns out that, that actually I've, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of comedians who are very serious people. Uh, and he turns out to be an incredible man of courage. His whole family uh, uh, is courageous. He won by 73% of the vote, which indicates something about Ukraine today that is very different than even some of its neighbors. Um, there's less than 5% of Ukrainians have anti-Jewish attitudes, but right next door in Romania and in others, it, it's 15%, it's 20%. So he's really, there's a very interesting mix of Jews and Christians now involved in this government, not just Mr. Zelensky. And, and it's, it's, it, it, they're, they're under assault for being, you know, trying to build a democracy. It's very tragic in many ways. I think it shows the discernment of the Ukrainian people who have seen in him and heard in him during his campaign uh, things that uh, they could trust and that they could re rely upon. And certainly this war over there has demonstrated their judgment and uh, illustrated uh, what kind of courage and leadership and fortitude this man has. I've been very impressed and um, I'm sure uh, much of the world, I'm sure, I'm sure Putin has been very surprised uh, mm -hmm. to uh, have an adversary like this man. Right. Yeah, I think that it is a surprise. I think that he thought that, uh, that this would be a pushover case like his uh, direction of the Syrian leadership, but it isn't just a family, you know, a corrupt family that Mr. Putin can direct. This is a very serious country and in fact, their kinship with the Russian people is something also that Mr. Putin has miscalculated. These are, these are kin. These are millions of Ukrainians around the world, the, the, the Jewish community, the, the, uh, the Russian community itself. You can't separate Russians and Ukrainians and then demonize them as neo-Nazis. The, the propaganda of that, the absurdity of that is self-evident. Uh, whereas you could get away with this with Syria, and you can't, not here. Yeah. You know. Let's talk about the Jewish community in Ukraine. Uh, I had not really given this much thought uh, until I started researching it after the war began. You think of Ukraine as a Christian country, as an Orthodox uh, Christian country. We'll get back to that in a minute, but talk to us a little bit about the history of Judaism in Ukraine. It's, it's hard to overestimate how many of the most significant spiritual cities in the Jewish world come out of Ukraine. Really? I, oh yeah, I myself, I mean, I come from, my, my family left Ukraine 110 years ago uh, in an area called Volynia Gabernia, the, the Wait a minute. province of- Your family is from Ukraine. Yes, yes, my I whole family. I did not plan. know this. Yeah. So you're one of, wow. And, and uh, it's, you know, part of my, my mother's side is from Lithuania, Latvia, but my father's clan is from Ukraine and uh, Western Ukraine, about 200 miles east of Krakow. And, uh, and that was a contested area between Poland and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But the roots are very deep, deep for so many different uh, spiritual works were written and so many followers of different spiritual guides were all over Ukraine, um, you know, Kiev and East especially. And it, it's just um, a remarkable evolution to see a, a place that we left in the middle of terrible wars from the uh, attempted revolutions to the World War I to World War II, just disastrous relationships. And then to now feel this kinship and the Jewish community there still is very large. We're hundreds of thousands of, of Jewish people. 
they're all being, um, people are escaping, there's rabbis taking out Torahs, it's a very um, a powerful uh, moment, and um, Jewish people in Israel are just incensed that they're not, they're, they want their country more involved in protecting Ukrainians. So there's a kinship between Jews and Christians right now over Ukraine that is so different than 100 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's just a, a flourishing of a relationship with a, with, um, and, and it's not, you know, a lot of them are secular, but many of them are religious on both sides, and there's a deep kinship. Yes, I, I think Zelensky himself, uh, the literature says, comes out of a secular Jewish family. Let mm -hmm. me ask you about the role of Israel in all of this. Um, how does this large Jewish population uh, pull Israel into the equation? Well, uh, there is, as you said, most Ukrainians are, are secular and not, not, not religious and and many are escaping now. Um, so there's going to be a lot of discussion about basically any, any one of them can come to Israel. There, there, there are right. people rushing in. And so we're going to see a big exodus um, uh, to Israel. And so that's evoking discussions. But there's also humanitarian aid discussions. There's about, um, you know, Israel has the capacity to conduct secret military operations. And they get people out sometimes who are in danger. So I don't know what's being discussed, but I, I think it's complicated by the fact that, that, um, that Israel has to balance. They have, Russia is right there in Syria and, and in Lebanon. And so basically they have to balance power mm -hmm. and, and are not eager to, um, to pick a fight with Russia too quickly, similar to Turkey and others. And so it's interesting that both Turkey and, and Israel have rushed into a mediating role at the official level. Mm -hmm. And so at the official level, Bennett goes into Moscow and then he goes and talks to Zelensky by phone and he's rushing in as a mediator. Countries rush in as mediators when they're being afraid of being caught in the middle. Right. And, and Turkey is already taking so many refugees from Ukraine because they have a border with Ukraine right. and they have excellent relations. So I suspect Israel and Turkey are in the same position, but the people of the world, including especially the people of Israel, are outraged. And if Mr. Putin thinks that he's won points for grievances against NATO, he's done the opposite. Yes. He's driving the whole world towards yes. NATO. Yeah, they are. And and uh, um, and and it's just it, forget about the boycotting of oligarchs and all the consequences economically. The world has turned in a certain direction because Ukraine was undeniably a democracy, and uh, and and this effort uh, by him and by others to undermine it from the beginning is backfiring on him completely. In yes, terms I of think uh, he, security he, situation. Yeah, Putin certainly did not anticipate uh, how his actions would galvanize the West and uh, the democracies, NATO the, and the European Union. And, um, but I just wondered whether uh, Israel would have, this heightens the threat that they feel. Um, you know, they are constantly in a precarious position balancing so many things uh, Israel is. And, um, uh, this is just one more of them. So, um, Zelensky. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Well, well, they also they they also are threatened by. Uh, I mean, this is a blatant testing of attacking democracies itself. Yes, it is. And with all of Israel's flaws and problems and the lack of a of a resolution between them and Palestinians, they also are a country that could be attacked as sort of a Western poison. And they have right. been. And this sure. framing by Putin is a very dangerous frame for countries that are trying to be a democracy in the middle of, um, of places where there can be religious extremism. So Putin is playing a very dangerous game of setting the precedent for extremist ideology attacking democracy. And everyone's walk watching. China's watching. Israel's watching because they're nervous about how much this will catch. Of course, 
we have watched China gradually take over Hong Kong. We watched Russia take over Crimea. We, we know uh, that uh, China has interest uh, on Taiwan and there's a, a lot of tension there. And, and now Russia has uh, invaded Ukraine. So I do think the autocrats on one side and the Democrats on the other are watching. This is a very dangerous long running game that we're in. Right. I decide where we can draw a line, how far the autocrats will go. And uh, certainly Putin has upped the ante considerably on all of these uh, uh, tension points around the world. I know you've been involved in this for a long time. On these well, I, I was just on I was just on television in the Middle East and they were we were analyzing this. And the, the dangerous thing also is that he's playing the same playbook from Chechnya and Syria. And mm -hmm. that is that we wanted to blame chemical weapons attacks on civilians on Assad. But everybody is rushing to get equipment in there to protect against chemical weapons because he's already attacking mm -hmm. hospitals and escape routes, which is exactly what, what the Air Force did in Syria, uh, uh, the Russian Air Force. And so this, this, um, these abuses, we, we used to see these abuses 100 years ago from autocratic leaders, but he's getting it closer and closer to home. And it's very nerve wracking that, that Putin seems to be um, engaged in a kind of murder suicide or self-destructive pattern and a rage against open society that is very uh, concerning uh, about where this can end and whether we can have a rational conclusion. Uh, that's, that's why when I was just on TV, I was emphasizing ceasefire with, with gestures about no attacks on civilians. Because the attacks on civilians are the key indicator of whether this is a dispute about security or whether this is a vendetta that is um, well mentally unstable, or or that is ideologically extreme, and I know you're going to get into that about religion and spirituality here. It's a defining moment on on religion too, and on 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 whether religion is is beautiful and inclusive or murderous, and that's that's something going on in his mind the way it did with other leaders. Yes. Yes, I do want to talk about this. We've talked about the Jewish angle a little bit. Um, the larger uh, religious angle is with the Orthodox Church. Not all of our uh, uh, audience today will remember uh, will, or will even know that in 2019, the Orthodox the Christian Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which has been for a long time under the authority of the Moscow Patriarch of the Orthodox Church, uh, sought and secured their independence within the uh, Orthodox world. And uh, it was granted so by the Patriarch of, um, of uh, or what is the Turkish? Um, Bartholomew? Uh, they, who, the town, uh, uh, I can't call the town there in, uh, in Turkey, the, the, uh, the leading city of, of, of Turkey. You mean Istanbul? Istanbul. I yeah. kept wanting to call it Constantinople. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, I understand Istanbul. that. <laughs> so the, the Orthodox Patriarch of, of Istanbul is the, generally the first among equals in the Orthodox Church. He granted the, the Ukrainian request to become uh, their own independent church. Autocephalus is the technical word. And uh, so I have been reading the statements of the world Orthodox leaders, not only the Orthodox Church in America, which issued a statement uh, this past week, the statements of the Moscow Patriarch, the statements of the Ukrainian Patriarch. How does this play out? What is, the, what is the role of this religious tension uh, in the Orthodox world? Well, th this is what's, what's interesting. I, you know that my, I've spent the last 30 years studying, writing books about multi-faith diplomacy, but also mm -hmm. multi-faith conflict. And the Orthodox Christian case is a very interesting one in the sense that, that Orthodoxy, unlike Catholicism, has always had 
very independent churches based on countries. And what we're seeing is, is that the more that Orthodox people live in, in democratic countries, they tend to have more, more, um, more independent thinking. And so the Orthodox Patriarch in, in uh, Istanbul has to accommodate everyone. And unfortunately, uh, I, I worry that there, the siege mentality that Mr. Putin has as former KGB with a certain perspective on the world of the shrinking empire, that, that the Orthodox Church in Moscow is, is starting to reflect the same kinds of, of, of conspiracy and especially uh, attack on Western ways of life uh, and certain kinds of people. And, and it's reflected in the statements that are coming out of the Moscow mm -hmm. Orthodox Church that are very different than the mm -hmm. Ukrainian Orthodox Church, than mm -hmm. the rest of the world. Right. And so this kind of isolation, uh, it, it often doesn't end well. And that's, that's the influence of secular leaders. Putin is a secular leader, but he's having an outsized impact on the style of Russian Orthodoxy and on the intention and on their alliances with very extremist biker groups. Uh, there's a biker group across Russia that attacks um, minorities, and, and it's it's uh, Putin sponsors it, and it's it's very much like militias, and and that is come that's coming that's that's an orthodox alliance with that, which is which feels very fascist in its origins, uh, in terms of an alliance with a, a violent bikers group that's informal. So it has, it's very nerve wracking and it doesn't reflect the high Russian, the high Orthodox Christian theology that we've seen evolve in, in, in the last decades. Very interesting, mm -hmm. compelling, great multi-faith work. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of wonderful Orthodox, Catholic, Jewish conversations going on. I, I was privileged to go to a Greek Orthodox um, seminary in Boston to speak a few years back about the Middle East. I had a wonderful time. Everything is evolving in a good direction, but Moscow is different. And that's, that's what we have to grapple with here. Yes, I'll have to say when I launched the Academy of Preachers in 2008, some of the very first people to get involved were the Orthodox Church in America. I have one of my students who came out of the Baptist tradition who converted and went to St. Vladimir's Seminary up in, uh, the, up in New York, a place where I have been a number of times. And um, I've been in correspondence uh, with some of the faculty up there uh, just over the last few days uh, about uh, their perspective on what's going on. Here is a very interesting thing, uh, Mark, and coming more out of my world uh, as I am rooted in the uh, broader evan uh, white evangelical world in, in the United States. Um, this religious nationalism, and I've been doing a lot of shows recently about religious nationalism, has been um, attracted to the church state dynamics in Russia Correct. and have promoted it as a model for church state dynamics in the United States. This is one of the reasons I think why Putin, I mean, why uh, Trump was so uh, warm-hearted to uh, Putin and why the evangelicals were so warm-hearted toward Trump. They see this official embrace of a state religion and the suppression of minority rights, especially gay lesbian rights, uh, which is uh, rampant in Russia. They see this as uh, a desirable future for the United States. And, uh, it's been very interesting to watch uh, leaders in this network be very, very cautious in their criticism of Putin and Russia because uh, here in the invasion time. In fact, as they turn their, their rhetoric against Biden rather than against Putin, it's been a really a weird thing to watch happen. Have you observed this? or? Uh... Yes, I'm watching it very closely, and I watched for... I was very, very nervous at the way in which um, 
I mean, I have a broad interpretation of it, and that is that there's a confusion here of spirituality and religion yes. with, with white supremacy mm -hmm. and bastions of white supremacy or the fear of the big changes afoot when, when people of color become equal, when, when gay people become equal. Mm -hmm. It's how, do you, how can you be conservative at the same time that there's a world around you that defines marriage differently? And, and I think both liberals and conservatives have to talk more deeply about coexistence than they are. And I think it's on both sides because waiting at the wings is, 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 not, is ultra nationalism and yes. militarism and yes. white nationalism and white supremacy because yes. people retreat and they say, okay, the last bastions of our way of life and our God are in the white people in Moscow and the white people here, you know? And, and God forbid, it's not being spoken out, out, outwardly as much, but we don't want that to happen because that's just a race war. That's nothing to do with God. And, and we've had this happen before in history. And unfortunately, gay people uh, are always the, the assault on manhood of people like Mr. Putin. It happened in, in the Nazi Holocaust as well. And I, this is a test case for conservative religion. How can you maintain your values and even your commitment to heterosexual marriage, et cetera, and at the same time not fall prey to yeah. this use of religion for uh, an ultra macho hatred of others, of, of homosexuals, of, 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 uh, of uh, people of color. I mean, there's all sorts of permutations here that I think that the conservative Christian world really needs to wake up to and say, well, you know, I have my way of life, but I'm not gonna align myself with that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it is true predominantly in the white Christian world, and um, which are my own roots, of course, but there are also elements of, uh, of the Jewish world and the Muslim world that are the same way, especially in their uh, fierce uh, resistance to uh, equal rights for uh, LB, uh, LGBTQ people. Um, and it's a, it's a problem that runs across the religious world. And um, but this is one of the, I, I agree with your statement a minute ago, that this is a great test for a conservative Christians in the United States. And uh, that they are, their silence in, uh, over the last two weeks is, uh, they're struggling internally about what to say about all this. Right. Because there's so much about uh, Putin and Russia that they like. And they're just very hesitant to criticizing, uh, even for this this blatant attack on. Um, and I, I was just reading, I just wrote on it, um, well, in part of the news this morning, how many of the large evangelical international organizations have major offices and operations in Kiev. Uh -huh. And how, how this is, how the surrounding of, by the Russian army is is challenging all of them to um, uh, deal deal deeply with this, and of course there's been some talk, as you know, Mark, about about this question: Why is it that Americans and Westerners are so up in arms with sympathy and outrage on this refugee situation when they haven't been with Mexicans? and Syrians and Northern Africans. Um, and of course, the, the, the answer that some people are given is because Ukrainians are white. Yeah, and I, I think it's inescapable. I mean, everywhere you go, people have, I mean, I, the, the last book that I wrote is, on, is very much on the brain and understanding particularly what empathy is and what compassion is. And Give us the title of the book. Right. It's called it's Compassionate not... Reasoning, Changing the Mind to Change the World. Yeah. And it's a deep, a deep study of neuroscience together with ethics and a new way of, of moving people in a better and healthier direction. And one of the things that's so interesting about empathy and empathy with people who suffer is that the more kinship you feel, 
the more ways in which you immediately relate. There's no question that your empathy goes up, your anger mm -hmm. goes up when they're hurt. Mm -hmm. And it's only normal and natural uh, for there's millions and millions of Americans who have deep European roots. Mm -hmm. And those you they they also happen to be white, but but in my experience right now, when I see, for example, in Syria, I work deeply in Syria and Lebanon, and there was a kinship between Lebanese and Syrians that that allowed for millions of people to be absorbed in the same in Jordan and the same in Turkey. There's mm -hmm. there's very common cultures, mm -hmm. common backgrounds, and common skin colors, but it wasn't. It, it's people just have like there was a natural association between Syrians at the border and Turks at the border when over a million, two million came over and I was there with them. I was not one of them, but I felt the kinship, right? Now, on the other hand, I don't know if they absorbed Yemeni refugees, for example. Mm -hmm. you no, know, so people tend to have deeper empathy when they know that family's culture, when they know their background, when they know their religion. I don't think this is racism. I think this is kinship and, and also the sense of personal fear because Ukraine was a functioning democracy. Mm -hmm. And that also for anybody, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've been astonished at the West European response, despite all their oil and gas coming from Putin, mm -hmm. their, their fierce response because they feel we are, we are next. So there's kinship, yeah. and there's also kinship in terms of could we be the next victims, and that's only normal and natural. I don't. Um, I'm 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 starting to blame people less for that. There are there are not millions of refugees from Africa in in Jordan. They're they're from the Arab countries, and I, I, we have to accept kinship. It doesn't mean you're racist. It just means that your empathy flows deeper and your willingness to sacrifice for people who are familiar to you. Um, but we have to stand with the ethical human rights issues, uh, even when people aren't familiar to you. And, and that's where we stand in terms of this. That's a very perceptive and shrewd distinction you're making, uh, kinship versus racism. Uh, and I haven't, haven't encountered that anywhere. I'm gonna to have to mull this over I'm going to go back and listen to you again on this. Let me ask you, you are a, um, a professional uh, arbiter, um, a peacemaker. Uh, you travel the world uh, trying to understand people and trying to help people understand one another. What do you think the prospects are for uh, addressing this crisis in Ukraine? in, uh, in a, any peacekeeping initiative or a peacemaking initiative? Where would you start? Who could, who could do this? And what are the prospects for it? Part of the prospects are to understand the depth of the strategies here. And uh, I've seen this before with, uh, like I said, I, I happen to be one of those boundary breakers. And so I, I built kinship with people very different from me. Syria was an enemy of Israel and Jewish people had trouble, you know, terrible trouble there. But I, um, you know, I developed kinship. It's very similar to what's happening here. The Syrian democratic forces were assaulted by all sides because of the threat of democracy. Democracy is a threat to authoritarianism. Right. And so what, what Mr. Putin is doing, like a lot of authoritarians do and what he did in Syria, is to push the democratic people so badly that they become terrorists, that they become worse and worse in their behavior so that he has an excuse to occupy and destroy. And that's gonna be the question here of, of, of this contest. So what's our methodology? Our methodology is to pressure more and more by various means to get Putin to a ceasefire. Because once there's ceasefire, and this happened in the Balkans, it happens in many places. Once there's ceasefire and people can go out onto the street and the refugees can start to return, the people will make the choice for the world, okay? Russian, Russian people have tried to demonstrate in 50 cities of Russia. Mm -hmm. They are kin with yes. Ukrainians. Yes. There is no historical 
conflict. You can say in the Balkans, it's very tough because there was 800 years of, of vying between Orthodox Catholic and Muslim, but there's nothing of that in Ukraine and Russia. And so if the people are able to go back on the street, they will voice their opinions, both Russian and Ukrainian inside Ukraine. And so what we have to do is figure out how to get the man to stop bombing civilians. And that's where the concentration needs to be. I, don't, I agree with, I mean, I, I have to say, I also, I mean, truth be told, I've never been a fan of NATO being the only option. I am a big believer in the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation. I do believe that in the age of Gorbachev, there should have been an aggressive embrace of the Russia of the time into collective security arrangements. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen because of, of uh, arrogance and triumphalism. And now we sit with a, a, a man in a corner so determined to destroy his enemies that not only is he destroying civilians, but we know that he penetrated American culture deeply for, for 10 years now with the most absurd lies that captured the imaginations of nationalists, yes. white nationalists here. Yes. And that is a poison inside America that he purposely planted. So we are stuck with Putin as the leader right now, but we also have to look at our sins and mistakes and say, how can we grab the Russian people into a new collective security with Europe so that they don't feel surrounded? And that's going to take some honest conversations with, uh, with NATO. I mean, a lot of the neighbors of Russia now are even more motivated to join NATO. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. I sympathize with it. Sure. But somehow we have to envision Russia beyond Putin. And, and maybe he'll be falling on his sword from what he's done. Uh, but the most important thing is to get us to ceasefire and to a rational, honest discussion about collective security and then the people on the streets will make their choices. Well, I do want to ask you about what world leader or what world or organization is best positioned to help affect a kind of a ceasefire, but I do want to comment, respond. One of the most heartening things that has happened um, in the last two weeks are the street demonstrations in Russia against this war. And I know thousands of these people have been arrested and hauled off, but I think it's pretty clear that uh, many of the Russian people themselves don't want this war, don't support the war. Correct. And, uh, you know, it's been, I, I can't remember a time when, I guess it's been 30 years since the fall of the right. Soviet empire when so many Russians were in the streets, uh, uh, protesting, uh, rallying for uh, something, uh, you know, against their government. And this is, this is a very democratic thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> for, for the people to take to the streets to protest their government. Um, so let me ask you about uh, who in the world is in a position to affect a ceasefire in Ukraine. So the issue of ceasefires and and the, the there's a, there's sort of a bouncy ball of the way in which negotiations happen, and and the good offices of Turkey right now are one effort where the the foreign ministers of the two countries came together, and that was because of of Turkish interests mm -hmm. in both countries and Turkish dealing with the refugees, etc. There could be more mediators like that. We can't predict where that's going to come from, but I, I, we want to encourage all of that in terms of the political elite negotiation level. But what I'm, but, but, but you know, Dwight, you're in a, you're in a, a spiritual work that's combined with public media work, mm -hmm. and in my, my experience. Um, the public media and, and the, the religious spiritual opinions around the world matter a great deal. Mm -hmm. And what, what Mr. Putin has tried to do is capture uh, Russian orthodoxy for a, a religious war. 
Yes. And and he did it based on this this split with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. But it's it's very important that 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 Jewish Christian Muslim leaders come together um, with secular folks and and embrace um, ceasefire and the end of war. Uh, and, and in a very vociferous way, it's very important that we do not demonize the Russian people. Mm -hmm. And I, we've seen that among Ukrainians. I mean, Ukrainians are not shooting on sight soldiers who surrender. They are bringing them on television yeah. to talk to their mothers. Yes, I saw. That's, that's ingenious. We should yes, learn from them. As often, often is the case, you learn peace building from people on the ground. And we should do that as religious leaders. We should embrace um, and then make it very public through radio, through media, that we are not against the Russian people. We're not against Russian Orthodox. We're not even against Russian Orthodox conservative folks. We just want to work out the issues of coexistence between people of color, between genders in a nonviolent way. And, and that we don't want any, any, any uh, authoritarian leaders or, or, or racial movements to capture us. Yes, That's what we need I to have, do. I have been concerned that the, all of these boycotts and isolation of the Russian people, the banks pulling out, the businesses pulling out, uh, that this is, is gonna hurt the Russian people, it's gonna isolate them, right. it's going to, um, uh, that it, instead of focusing on Putin and his armies, uh, it's as if we've chosen to uh, uh, punish all of the Russian people. Correct. I, I, there could be negative, long-term negative consequences of this, because I do think, like you're suggesting, that many of the Russian people, they have great affinities for the freedoms in the West and the, the economic achievements of the West. They want better connections with the West. And this is going to interrupt that. It's going to make it more difficult to pick up the pieces after uh, the, the fighting ceases. But your, your idea that, I, I, I just wonder uh, the power of social media, you mentioned a minute ago about, I saw that, that video of, of, <laughs> of serving the Russian soldier tea and letting him call his mom. Um, what role these Orthodox patriarchs uh, from around the world could play in this if they could be seen together um, in some uh, place in Ukraine or Russia or um, the symbolic power of it, uh, uh, emphasizing their oneness, uh, not only in the Christian world, but the Orthodox world. What I think that would, any effort to create those photographic moments on those common statements that's what religious elites do they they take pictures together and they make mm -hmm. statements and that would be wonderful um if they were serving the, the the poor together or doing anything ethical there's a tendency to in the elite religious worlds to focus on words and not on deeds right and and it's more powerful to see them doing something together for the sake of humanity, for example, and 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 if the Orthodox, if the Orthodox of America, Russian, Ukrainian, and and Greek and others, gathered together, mm -hmm. not with anti-Putin statements, but statements of solidarity with humanity, right. and and right. Oppo opposition to war and opposition to hurting civilians, that would be more than enough. And then we, in media or in writing, we need to amplify that. We need to interview, have them on the programs together, and then and then and then project that outward, all in order to make this um, to distinguish true religion from the bastardization of religion for uh, for ultranationalism or or uh, fascism. Wow, boy, you've given me a lot to think about. I'm going to go back and and watch this program and listen again, because uh, you've just said a number of things, just this issue right here of religious leaders coming together in, in public, uh, serving communion to, together, uh, praying for people, laying, uh, laying hands on, on people, distributing bread, 
uh, talking to soldiers, talking to uh, uh, refugees. Boy, this would be so powerful um, uh, right now. Um, uh, of course, I, I'm not in a position to, I mean, I don't know any of these people, obviously, but I can see immediately where, where this would be very, very powerful. Yes, we have, you and I have friends, and I think I, I would love to help them behind the scenes to talk about it, talk it through. These are complex things. You got to make sure that there's trust, you know, on what you're going to say and not say, you know, because people are in delicate political positions. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very important to try to orchestrate these moments of togetherness um, to, to re rescue orthodoxy from its use by, mm -hmm. by politicians in the yeah. same way we had to do in World War II, ultimately. Uh, but let's do it before, you know, you know, millions of people die. Let's let's yeah. do it, you know, now. Mark, you're always great to talk to. And I look forward to uh, reading your book and uh, bringing you back into the meeting house uh, to talk about the book. Uh, I've just been, ever since you mentioned it, I'm going to, I envision not just me and you, but maybe a couple of other people joining us in a, in a discussion of this book. Would love to. Uh, as it deals with um, the brain um, and uh, those types of things. Mark, God bless you and your work. Uh, God keep you safe and you. make you um, successful uh, as, a, as a teacher, as an advocate, as a person, uh, as a member of the human race. I look forward to uh, connecting with you again. Uh, be safe and uh, uh, God bless you and, and your family. Thanks to you. you. Thank you. Thank you for joining the Meeting House today. We've had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Mark Gopin, Rabbi Mark Gopin. He is the Executive Director of the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter Center for World Religions, Diplomacy, and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University in the greater Washington, D.C. area. And I'm always delighted when he stops by the, the Meeting House to talk to us. Uh, I have a commentary now uh, before we close out the show entitled The Open Table. I served communion this past Sunday at the small church I pastor in Western North Carolina. There were 20 and one of us in the sanctuary. And except for three people who were concerned about the COVID, we all gathered around the table to receive the bread and the wine. Only in our small Baptist church, it really wasn't wine. But what happened before, during, and after the Lord's Supper pushed the boundaries of what we mean by an open communion, especially for this old preacher who grew up at the epicenter of closed communion country in Kentucky. For almost 2,000 years, Christians have debated how open and how closed this central ritual should be. I had just seconds in this service this past Sunday to reveal my own stance on an open and closed communion. First, some background. Jesus, you recall, ate frequently with everyone. It was a central element of his earthly ministry. My favorite story is Jesus inviting himself to the house of Zacchaeus. Come down out of that tree, you recall Jesus saying. I I'm going to be a guest in your house. Food is not mentioned in the text, but it's strongly implied and often assumed. What is explicit elsewhere in the Gospels is the open invitation that accompanied so many of the meals where Jesus was present, children and their parents, the law keepers and the law breakers, friends from the village and strangers from afar, those in good standing in their religious tradition and those with no standing whatsoever. Come unto me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, Jesus said. It's hard to think of a better place to receive this promised gift than the dinner table where Jesus is the one who serves and speaks 
and saved. This practice of table fellowship, we sometimes call it, was the beginning of what we now call the Lord's Supper, or communion, or even the Eucharist. His early followers continued this pattern of mealtime spirituality. The New Living Translation puts it like this in the book of Acts, quote, they worshiped together in the temple and ate in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Later, Paul's description of the Lord's Supper is similar as written in his first letter to the church in Corinth. He called it an agape meal, using the Greek word for love. In and around the common elements of such a fellowship supper, they lifted the cup and passed the bread, invoking the death and resurrection of Jesus. But within 100 years of those early days in the Christian movement, Christians separated the common meal from the religious ritual leaving the food in the fellowship hall, we might say, and moving the bread and wine to the sanctuary. The former, the fellowship meal, remained open and inviting, but the latter became closed and limited. The former welcomed everyone. The latter excluded many. In other words, the open invitation of Jesus and his table of fellowship was replaced by a re religious ceremony closed to all but those properly baptized and in good standing with some authority, perhaps the bishop. Today, most Christians in the world attend communion services, or Eucharist as many call it, that are limited, not just to Christians, but to those whose baptism, confession, or membership is approved by some council, ministry, or authority. In other words, the Lord's Supper today excludes not only millions of Christians, but also billions of other people whose beliefs, belongings, and behaviors do not meet the standards of somebody somewhere. All of which brings me back to our little communion this past Sunday. Among the 21 in our sanctuary was a mother and her two small children, plus several others whose place on the gospel trail was unclear to me. I surveyed that small congregation before issuing my invitation to gather around the table. I wondered to myself, is our communion with the Lord around this table open or closed? Is it open only to those old enough, connected enough, and discipled enough? Or is it open to all those gathered in the Lord's house on the Lord's day? All 18 people approached the table, but our circle embraced. Also, the three who stayed apart, I passed the bread, kneeling to serve the two little boys, standing for the others. I distributed the, quote, wine, bending low to accommodate the little boys who had difficulty handling the small plastic cups. And then this happened. After the benediction, I took the half-empty tray that once was covered with cups full of grape juice. And I invited those people still circled around the communion table to deposit their empty cups in the communion tray. Everybody did until I stooped low for the little boy. Instead of placing an empty cup, he took a second cup of the sacred juice, so to speak. He drank it right down before I could speak or act. I looked at his mother and smiled. Later, my communion assistant took the little boy by the hand and set him down on the floor where she had put the communion tray. He proceeded to drain the rest of the cups. Later, I was reminded of the story told by Kevin Costner at the funeral of Whitney Houston about their experiences growing up in Baptist churches, especially having to do with the communion service. Well, in our little church in North Carolina, we had clearly broken all the rules of any and every church concerned about who can gather at the Lord's table and who can't. We had, right there in front of God and everybody, declared our own determination to, well, be like Jesus and welcome anybody and everybody. I'm sure there are religious people, good religious people, who, like their kinfolk of old, will accuse us of being too careless, too clueless, too casual 
about eating and drinking with Jesus. Maybe they're right. I don't think so. What do you think? I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House. That's my commentary for the week. This is our program for the week. Thank you for listening and watching on our broadcast. We encourage you to share this on your social media. Maybe tag people that you think might appreciate the commentary, the news, or that fascinating conversation with Rabbi Mark Gopin. You can join us next week right here in the, in the Meeting House. Thursdays at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time, but you can always go to our website at themeetinghouse.net where all of these programs are archived as podcasts. You can listen to them anytime and as many times as you want. God bless you all. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Be kind to everyone you meet. Pray for our country. Pray for the soul of the country. that We might have unity and grace and mercy and kindness. That's all from the meeting house today. I'm Dwight A. Moody. Thank you for joining us. I'll see you next week. You have been in the meeting house with host Dwight A. Moody. Thank you for watching or listening today. Visit our website at themeetinghouse.net for more news, reviews, commentaries, and conversation on religion and American life.